True Crime. I am your host, Dan Marie, and I love true crime. I am your co-host, Mark, and I hate true crime. We'll discuss old and new, solved and unsolved Missouri true crime cases. And sometimes we'll take a road trip or fly around the world to bring you a mystery from other parts of the world. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Mo True Crime. Please like us and share with your friends. This podcast is not suitable for children. Please use caution when listening around others as the subject matter can be upsetting. Welcome to Mo True Crime. We're going to talk about the Streetwalker Strangler, Maury Troy Travis uh, from Ferguson, Missouri. What do we know about this guy, Emery? What's going on? Maury was born on October 25th in 1965 in Ferguson, Missouri. His mom, Sandra Travis, um, at the time of his arrest, his girlfriend was Felicia Ramey, and she called him Toby. So if we get in this a little bit, I, I find this interesting that he had a girlfriend while all this was going on. Is that right? Same girlfriend? He wasn't, he was never married, was he? No, he was never married that I know of. How long was he with this girlfriend? I don't know. Okay. All right. There's not a whole lot known about his background. So what did he like to do? What, what What's his deal here? Why are we Why are we talking about him? So Maury had ten, between 10 and 20 victims in a two-year period, mostly prostitutes. Did they find all the prostitutes? No. How many do we know that they found? They found six victims. And did he confess... So how'd they know there was 12? So in the documentary, they talked about there were 12. How'd they find these other ones? Do you know? The documentary that you're talking about is narrated by Bill Curtis called A Map to Murder. It, it states that it's from 2000, but I don't think that's possible because Maury or Travis wasn't uh, arrested Active. until 2002. Yeah. So right. I think that is wrong, but that's on crimedocumentary.com. And there is a lot of information in there. Again, his background, not really well known. Six victims have been identified and bodies have been found. However, there's speculation that he could have killed much more than that. Yeah. So he in, in this documentary, he talked about the 17th victim. He said, and, uh, oh, he sent a note. Talk about this letter. Well, let's go yeah. through the, the victims. So all right. this all starts in the summer of 2001, specifically August 25th, 2001, St. Clair Avenue, 1100 block, East St. Louis, two victims. Oh, can we describe this? Let's, let's talk a little bit about this neighborhood, uh, East St. Louis in particular, and, and some of these areas where these bodies were found and where this was happening. Well, East St. Louis is right across the river from St. Louis, and East St. Louis is, uh, it's very barren. It's notorious for crime. For crime, for strip clubs, drugs, yeah. and, and dumping what, dead what bodies. What did the documentary say? Flesh peddlers. Yeah. Flesh peddlers, yeah. yes, yes. This first victim, which was not actually his first victim, but the first body found, was found, like I said, St. Clair Avenue, 1100 block, East St. Louis. Two victims were actually found there. Yvonne Cruz, uh, she was found naked and strangled. And then six weeks later on... About two miles away, yeah. I started... I didn't start. Because actually the first victim was found on April 1st, 2001. How'd they find the first victim? The first victim was found on the east side in Washington Park. 60th Street in a ditch on actually the Illinois side. That's right, the detective. Yeah, okay. She was identified oh, and then he by... came back... The clues led him back to St. Louis. Yeah, so she was identified by fingerprints as Elisa Greenway. She had no clothes on and she had been strangled. She was known as a prostitute and I believe a drug addict. So this is April 1st of 2001. And the case goes cold. They don't really have a whole lot of leads. I'm not sure if anybody was even really missing her or had reported her missing. And then May 15th of 2001, that same year. Yeah, it didn't really go cold though because it's April, 3 a.m., in May, that's only two months. I know, but they didn't really have any. They didn't link it to anything. No. Right. So they didn't, I don't, they didn't have any killer. suspects. Right. They didn't have any leads. Right. 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 It's and unsolved. it goes cold. Yep. For a very short time. And then May 15th in St. Charles County on Highway 67, the second victim is found, which could possibly not be his second victim, but the second body is found. Right. So we don't know if this is the second victim, but this is how they were found, the, the sequential order in which they were found. Right. So she had on no clothes, no purse. She was badly decomposed. They could not fingerprint her because she was so badly decomposed. Uh, but the victim did have a dental plate with an inscription that said Wilson 78. Yeah. So when, when this is mentioned, no purse, then it's assumed it's kind of a robbery, right? I mean, sometimes when you see like stuff's missing, okay, that's a robbery. It's not a crime or a passion or something like that, right? 
Okay, go ahead. I, I guess no first would mean you don't have any ident identification. Right. I don't know who it, this person was, they, right? They were unable to identify anything on her because she had no clothes, no purse, no, no, no things that people would usually carry, which in 2001, I don't think most people were carrying cell phones, so they didn't, that wasn't something they looked for, but they did look for a purse for identification, and she didn't have any of that. A month later... All right, so these are heading about four to six weeks. Yeah. Wilson 78 was found on the inscription in her dental plate and which she was that actually helped identify her and she was Teresa Wilson. A month later, 16 feet located 16 feet from where her body found, was found, where Teresa Wilson's body was found. Body three or victim three, Verona Thompson, her body was found. She went missing on June 23rd of 2001, and then six days later on June 29th, 2001, her body, her naked body was found dumped in a roadside ditch, which same area, 16 feet from, from Wilson. And this is St. Louis, or East St. Louis? No, this is in St. Charles County. St. Charles County, St. Charles County, Missouri. Yep. Yes. Yep. Because the bodies were so close together, this prompted law enforcement to send out a teletype. Yeah. Does anybody know what a teletype is? <laughs> uh, probably not. You'd have to look it up. I, I'm told that teletypes are still kind of common. I'm thinking that's Even like in... a fax or something, huh? The telephone yeah, type it's... letter. Maybe they faxed it around to other jurisdictions that, hey, you guys know any of this information? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So they sent a teletype, teletype to the surrounding agencies to see if they had anything similar, similar bodies in that type of condition. And they actually did. And that was the Greenwade case. As well as another case that was similar, which the, one of the similar cases was uh, a victim named Betty James. And when she was found, she was found in a yard um, in East St. Louis. You mean like somebody's backyard? Yeah. Um, there were tire tracks I mean, on her leg. Oh, yeah. It's like an alley or something, though. It's like an alley. Backyard alley, wasn't it? Yeah, which I will I will put those up for you to see the pictures of her leg, the, the tire tracks on her leg. Didn't actually think you could see tire tracks on a on, on flesh like that. So then in the summer of 2001... Well, they must have had to dust it or something, huh? Because the way in that, <clears throat> in that picture... It's black. But they had to put something over it. Well, I, I, I guess don't think they did. Black, That's how can, they... Yeah, so if you just get run over that tire transfers the black rubber onto your leg. I guess leg. so, yeah. So in the summer of 2001, there are now... I bet it's dirt, though. I know, I, I bet it's dirt, because when you're riding, you're riding in an alley, that dirt's picking up on that rubber, and then you ride over a, a human body or something, it's going to transfer that dirt. That's what they saw. The rubber's not going to come off. The dirt's going to be transferred to the skin Probably because the skin's a little more moist, it, it'll pick it up. Anyway. St. Charles County had, had found two bodies. There was the one in Washington Park, which was Greenwade, and then there was So Betty where's James. Washington Park? Washington Park was the first one that they found. That was Illinois, right? Right, but St. Charles County had not made the connection with, with Illinois police at this point. And then there was another victim, uh, Betty James, which was also in Illinois. So when they sent the teletype out, oh. they started to realize that there could potentially be a serial killer. And so in the summer okay, of 2001... So at, point, so at this point, they have... The first body's in East St. Louis, mm -hmm. which is Illinois. The next two they found were Missouri, St. Charles, Missouri, which St. is St. Louis, St. Charles County, which is Missouri. Then the fourth one is back over to Illinois. Yes. Okay. So when they started talking amongst themselves, the, the law enforcement officers realized that they, they could potentially have a serial killer. So in the summer of 2001, on August 25th in 2001, there was another body found in East St. Louis, St. Clair Avenue, the 1100 block. Actually, there were two victims, and that is Yvonne Cruz. She was found naked, also strangled. And then six weeks later... On October 8th, two miles away from from uh, the sixth victim, which would be Yvonne Cruz. In Brenda East St. Beas Louis. Yes, Br Brenda Beasley is found strangled in a field. Okay, okay, so let's just summarize all these bodies we've got now. First one's East St. Louis. The next two were St. Charles County, Missouri. The fourth one was East St. Louis. The fifth and sixth one were also East St. Louis, right? Yes. Okay, and then so do we have a seventh one yet? The fifth and sixth victim differed from the first four as the murderer left semen inside the victim. So DNA, the are we, DNA. Are we sure? We're sure that it was inside the victim. Yes. Okay. It wasn't on the victim. And these are it was all inside the victim. Uh, street walkers, prostitutes type individuals. Yes. They were apparently had had drug addictions and uh, could have been prostitutes. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about this a little bit. <clears throat> what trends or what assumptions can we maybe draw from this individual? You know, I'm thinking he's has a fetish for prostitutes or they're easy 
all these victims we know didn't really have too much of a family life. Well, I think some of them, there's not a whole lot about the victims, but I know some of them had kids and they, they struggled with addiction. And, you know, usually drugs, in that drugs. type of situation, okay. yeah. the which came first, the addiction or, you know, if so they the have an addiction, they need to pay addiction. for it. Right. So it was easy, relatively easy way to get enough money to feed that addiction, right? Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure that just from the pictures of Maury Travis that I've seen, and there was a coworker that was interviewed, and they, she said it was, it was a white girl. All of these victims up to this point are have been um, African American, and Maury Travis is African American as well. There was a white female that he had worked with at the time his of his arrest. Uh, he was working as a waiter, and she said that he was a really nice guy, not anybody she feared or was scared of. So I'm not sure when he approached these women that so does, do they would be scared of him. So do you think he has an issue with African-American prostitutes or, or women that put this in a situation? Because do we want to get into the torture part and some of the video that we've seen? Let's let's finish this part okay. of it. All and right. then we'll, the we'll, go, we'll go back to... Maybe what, after we talk about these victims a little bit, we'll check this thing, right? Yeah. Okay. There was DNA found in these these last four, these last two victims, and the DNA was actually linked. The semen. The seam, right? The semen inside each victim was linked to the same person, so they knew that they had now a, a male yeah. profile, and the semen was in both of the victims. In October, the DNA for this this male profile was added to CODIS, which is the National DNA Database, and there were no hits. This is still what they use today, CODIS, right? Yes. CODIS is, yeah. The DNA was then used, when there was no hits in CODIS, the DNA was then, they call it screening, where they start looking in local precincts and local agencies for... You mean like county jails rather than federal or something? Yes, for hits on on DNA. DNA. And there was, there was no hits on that either. In... November of 2001, the killing stopped, just altogether stopped. And there were theories that law enforcement had, which was, of course, you know, 2001, we have 9-11. So they thought maybe this uh, person could have been in the military and had been called away, or the person had been sent to prison. Basically, at this point, there's six unsolved murders that go cold. Or he could have gone to war or something like that, right? Because this was around uh, 9-11. Yeah, that's what I thought. If he... Yeah. Okay. Was in the military and was yeah. deployed. Yeah. It basically goes cold. Nothing's happening until the following year in May of 2002. So in May of 2002, there is a reporter at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Bill Smith, who receives a letter. And remember, this is 2002. So I think this is the days of Comic Sans being the coolest font ever. And it kind of looks like that's what he used, something like Comic Sans or some kind of... Yeah, I've never heard of that. I didn't get into that that much. Funky font, but the letter basically said that if you want to know if I'm real or not, here's here's a map to another body, and it is. So this is three pieces of evidence. You have an envelope, the letter, and now the map. And the letter, um, I think it kind of looked a little odd. So on the outside of the envelope, the return address was a masochistic website, and if you go to that website, it was called Thraldom. I don't know if that's still around, T-H-R-A-L-L-D-O-M. It's been described as under a graphic of flowers, rakes, and a beehive. That was the uh, return note address. A in red. A note typed in red. Right. So the, red. so the yeah. note was typed in red, and it had this little, you know, old school font. And it said, nice, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson. So Bill Smith had written a nice article about one of the victims, Teresa Wilson. Bill Smith is who? He's Bill the... Smith is the reporter for St. Louis Post Dispatch, yeah. and he had written this story. He receives this letter in, in regarding this story and says, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson. Write one about Green Wade. Write a good one, and I'll tell you where many others are. To prove I'm real, here's directions to number 17. Search in a 50-yard radius from the X. Put the story in the Sunday paper like the last one and then there was a second sheet of paper and it was kind of a square it had been cut and it had a map so these this guy he wants to be found it's like this is kind of this is kind of his way i don't know if he wants to be found but he wants this story to get out well it had gone cold and nobody was talking about him and a lot of these serial killers want the recognition they want do you think that some of these serial killers want you to think like they do so that they feel normal, right? So he, obviously no. he has some angst about women prostitutes, right? And I got to believe he's thinking, hey, guys, we need to do something about these, these women. I'm trying to do something. 
come on my side and let's do something about this. Or something. Well, it's hard to tell specifically for Travis because he his background is is little known of his background, so it's hard to say with him. But yeah, but I this, mean there but are this serial life killers like he worked with didn't feel threatened by him or anything. Right. And so therefore he made no advances to her. It would seem he did not want to. He didn't pull her. He could have, if he was just wanting to take lives to take lives, he could have killed her, right? I mean, he could have. He could have, like, grabbed her one night and just killed her, right? Probably not, because it wasn't on his terms, and she wasn't an easy target. Like, he would, from what I understand, he would not only get these women that were easy targets in by, you know, luring him, them in by drugs or by money. So, unless a, someone that's not a prostitute or a drug addict just willingly goes with you, they're not... There's no motive, means, and opportunity there. It would be harder to have that kind of victim. That's why prostitutes and drug addicts are easy victims. And that's why they're usually victimized because, you know, they do have an addiction or they they need money. Yeah, I guess. Let's get back to the letter. A letter was sent to Bill Smith. And we've got the letter and then we've got the map. He immediately takes this to law enforcement. And by the way, the return address was that masochistic website. And then the return address, he had handwritten that website. He had just handwritten it. Oh. Like he didn't put it as his return address. And then the stamp was a U.S. flag that was actually upside down. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it was upside down. He, Bill Smith gets this and obviously realizes this is probably from the serial killer of these of these six victims and so he takes it to law enforcement law enforcement immediately go to this location on the map which is actually on highway 67 which which is in st charles county where we've already found two victims they get the map they go and they actually do find to find a body with the exact i mean it was exact location it was an intersection of highway 67 and st charles street in west alton in an area along former mkt railroad tracks which is now the katie trail so while law, law enforcement are looking in this area, finding a body, they also have agents trying to track down where he could have gotten this map. And they found that the map was downloaded from Expedia.com and through subpoenas to the website and the ISP. Through subpoenas to the website and uh, the ISP, the internet service provider, authorities were able to determine there was only one person who had clicked on that particular map in that intersection. And it came back to an M. Travis. And they looked up that location, address, and intend to go to the home. So at the time, at this time, Maury Travis is on, he's working as a waiter. He's on parole. He was on parole for a robbery in 1989. He lives at, um, he lives on, what is it, Ford Drive in um, Ferguson, Missouri. So they show up 7 a.m. in the morning. When things went cold in, in the fall to the spring, when they had the theories of why the killings had stopped. They actually found out that Travis had, he had been locked up from November 2001 to February of 2002 when the killings had stopped. I don't really know exactly why. I think he might have had a probation violation. Not really sure. I did look up his offenses on CaseNet. We can go over those at some point later, but I don't see one for that particular year. And usually that's a probation violation. One of the things we were wondering is when he was locked up in November of 2001 when the killings did stop, wouldn't DNA at that point be in CODIS because he was, you know, locked up? And the only thing I can think of is that it just, they weren't doing that back in that time. They weren't taking DNA from... I don't think the, the police detectives went and searched it again. They did all that work before he went back to uh, prison or back to jail. Then in October, November, they didn't do another search again. Hey, let's see if this guy showed up again. I know, but system. did they... How do we know that there was DNA on file from him just from going into the jail? That wasn't always the case. It sounds like it was. Anytime you're a felony, you get uh, DNA taken. But when did that start? Was that happening in 2001? I mean, maybe someone like out there listening can can let us know when that actually started. Why don't we just look it up? So we got the web for it. <laughs> It's not confrontational. You don't have to have people come and call you and say, hey, that's my pound. Look it up on the internet. We've got the Expedia. Map. And then we found that it's Expedia. Right, so we got this guy. Let's, let's they they show bit, up. 
So so law enforcement go to Travis's home in Ferguson and 7 a.m. in the morning, and he's really upset that they show up this early. They told him that they wanted to talk to him about his computer. And at some point, he did he did let them in the house, and at some point, he kind of started cursing. Cursing the computer was eventually arrested. Did he and have, then, a, they have a, a warrant? How'd they get in? I mean, they just knocked, but they had to have a warrant. I believe huh? they did have a warrant because of the IP that led to his home. They don't come in and say, you did this. They said, this search came from your computer. And then he kind of incriminated himself when he started cursing the computer. He was arrested at that point and forensics came in. His upstairs of his house was very neat, very tidy. The downstairs of his house was a different story. There was a room. It was it was kind of... Um, it was a torture room. Just say it's a torture room. Yeah, but there, the ba- well, if you set up what the basement looked like, the basement was kind of... An, the house looks like kind of 70 style a ranch house. with a basement yeah with the basement and then uh you you go down the stairs which are enclosed stairs they're not open they go down and then you are we led into kind of an open room it's got the pillars in that like room some paneling yeah some wood paneling yeah very 70s and then you walk down a little hallway and there's a couple of rooms that go off of that and one of the rooms down there had just a bed and from the from the documentary and from pictures, the bed didn't even have a frame. It was just mattresses on the floor. And then it had a computer in there. When they started searching down there, they did find blood throughout the basement, blood spatters. And they also found a briefcase. Some. It wasn't like there was blood everywhere. They there were found... some in the carpet. There were some yeah. uh, you know, spatters on the wall. And then there were stains in the carpet because they, they did show a picture of the carpet peeled back. And it was clearly you know, a reddish stain. And they found a bunch of family videos down there too, I think. Okay. <laughs> Not really family videos. When they found a briefcase, well, first of all, they found a briefcase with pictures. And files. Thick files. And files, yes. And they found a lot of videos. And one of the videos, I believe it was called The Wedding Video. And Mm -hmm. it actually did start with a wedding. And then it goes shortly after goes to um, goes into a woman being chained up very graphic very brutal so the pictures are what the law enforcement end up using when they go and question him yeah so during this questioning he's out in the cop car and what happens well i think at this point they're in the interrogation room they've taken him in and they're talking to him and he said you know law enforcement says tell us about these girls in the pictures who are there no 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 no, that didn't happen yet then he was still in the car they were still going through his house he said i'll show you some more all right now this is what you guys want this is what you guys want Words. No, because then he said, take me to jail on the bridge. He said, take me okay. to jail. Right? Okay, so it's some, right? I, I mean, I, I really, Get your details straight, Amory. I really question your um, <laughs> chronological timeline, but okay, it, it, at some point. Anyway, they, they took a ride. They did at some point take a ride, but. Um, and as they were crossing the Mississippi, he had a change of mindset. He said, first on the way over, hey, I'm going to show you where some of these other things have happened are. And he's heading on over to Illinois. Him and the two cops. But see, this is why I question you, because they they sat him down and they questioned him and they said, who are the women in these pictures? And he says, I don't know any of them. I don't know who they are. And then they started to talk about something else. And then he says, hey, can I see the pictures of those dead girls again? Yeah, that was right there. And law enforcement says... We never told you these girls were dead. Right. That's all the while they're talking in the house and around the house okay. and in the cop car. So he gets silent at that point, And then he says, come on, I'll take you. And they get in the car and he's going to take them to more bodies in East St. Louis. And he, the law enforcement said they're about to cross the bridge into from St. Louis into East St. Louis. And he decides that he changed his mind. He's not going to take you, take the law enforcement. And he wanted to just be locked up. At that point. Right. The police officers comply. Right. So they get him back. And I guess it's some, I guess they do put him in an interview room at that point. And they asked him if he wanted a soda. He. Do you think they put him in an interview room in, was it St. Louis? They took him back to St. Louis or they took him to East St. Louis? Uh, No, St. Louis. Because it's St. Louis cops that were. Yeah, it was St. Louis Metro actually. They take him in. He said, yeah, I'll have a soda. So they take him a soda in. And after he's done drinking it, he throws it away. They grab it and they do DNA. And the two victims that had the DNA inside, it was actually a match. Um, to him from that Diet Coke can. It was his saliva on the can. Right. I thought it would be and fingerprints, it but saliva. Yeah. You can't do fingerprints? I thought that's what they did, like the classic, they give you this glass, but it's not. It's a soda can with your spit. Yes. I mean, you're not the the true crime expert that I am. Because <laughs> a fingerprint is much different than DNA, but anyway. Well, at least now we know, don't take anything from police officers or get in trouble. I mean, that's how they get you if you... if. 
you know, you've done something and they have DNA, they, they will try and trick you into doing that, but that's good. Um, so anyway, so they linked the Brenda Beasley and Yvonne Cruz semen that was found in both of those victims to that Diet Coke saliva on the can, the DNA, and his car was seized as well. When they were also um, going through his home, they also seized his car and they were able to match the tire tread left on victim Betty James on her leg. They were able to match that exactly to his car tires, which I think was an, was kind of odd to see because it was 2002, you know, two, but it was an old, I think, Chevy Cavalier. Was it a Cavalier? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Wait, what year? 2002. Oh, this is when it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, thought you said, I thought you were saying it was 2002 Chevy Cavalier. I don't think it was. This is June 7th when all of this happened. So he's arrested. His gigantic secret is found out. He's, you know, put in jail. He's in, being interviewed. He decides he's going to confess. Then he did, changes his mind. And all of his world as he knew it is just crumbling apart. Law enforcement's obviously got gathering a... a case against him with all of this evidence at his home. Unfortunately, three days later, on June 10th, 2002, he took the sheet in his room, in his jail cell, and wrapped them around... He made a noose. He made a noose, but he hung himself from... What was that? The, ex the, uh, the vent? Like the air vent, but it was round circle. It wasn't like the vent vents you have in, a, in your home. It's like these little circles where the air comes, comes through, but he somehow got that around. And you know, at the time, I remember a room that he had actually tied his own hands behind his back when he hung himself, which I thought I, I thought was really odd. And I know at the time there were all these rumors that cops had actually killed him or were insinuated that he killed him because his hands were tied behind his back. But in these videos and the few clips that are out there that Why you can cops look want at, to kill him? I don't know. I mean, you know how people are. One of the things in these in these clips that you'll see in these documentaries and news clips is this video of a female in that downstairs area tied or handcuffed to that pole. And if you can picture it, she's on her knees. Her arms are behind her back around the pole with handcuffs and her legs are cuffed as well. Chained. I don't know if they're cuffed. Oh, they're chained as well. Yeah. So it, it wouldn't make, I mean, it would make. She was naked. Right. But it would make sense that he would maybe tie his own hands together when he uh, killed himself. I, I don't feel that, that law enforcement had anything to do with that. But I remember at the time there were some accusations or insinuations of how did he, you know, how was he able to kill himself when his, his arms were tied behind his back. But he did do that himself. He took a lot of things to his grave. We do know that there were six victims and six bodies that were found. Law enforcement does say that out of all the videos, they were able to identify 12, is it 12 total? 12 total victims in the videos and there were six victims. So I don't know if he means six, the six victims were identified in that 12, but it seemed like they had pictures of six. But they called out 12. But we don't know where the 17 came from. And I don't know if that 12 means they weren't killed. They could have been just... I mean, I, I don't know. It's very... It's a gray area there that I'm not really sure of in terms of law enforcement. The thing that bothers me is that on that map, it said victim 17. And we only know of six bodies. I but think... they've only found six bodies. There's 12 at least 12 victims. But are those victims dead though? Just because unless they, well, well, I guess unless, well, I guess if they're on a victim of life, I guess that if they're on the video being killed, they would be a victim, but they're going to be, they could be a victim of just rape or, you know, it doesn't mean that they're actually killed. So that's a little, uh, I'm not really sure exactly about that. But the thing that, like I said, that does bother me is that that map said that was victim. Yeah, 17. But they would have come forward. They would have come forward. Those ones that weren't found, if they were just raped or something. Oh yeah. I know Maury. Yep. That's the guy right there. But you there. also have to understand these are these are transient people. They're from the area, right? This is like a close knit of prostitutes. Not really. Like a very familiar close knit of prostitute people. Not really. I mean, they don't all hang out together and have prostitute parties. No, I don't think so. I got to looking on Namus and. Um, just Namus? wanted Namus is a website where there are missing you can you can oh, see missing people. people and so I just wanted to look in that time frame because it looked like Maury Travis was active for two years from 2000 to 2002. I, I just looked in that time frame around Illinois and around Missouri of missing females that that match 
that profile of his victims because they did all have the same profile. They were all about same age and... What age was that? Because that one was 19. He said the first one he did... No, 19. none of those were actually 19. Yeah, he said in the video that she was 19. And none of these were 19, which means none of these was that woman. That's what my point is. Okay, my point is that you, your years might not be correct. Right, because I see your notes. You got 39, 31, 39, 24. These are women that that's are 20 years. These are women that are missing. I know. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that profile, but that profile is pretty. Well, broad. one of these victims, I think it might have been Verona. I'm not sure which one. She was actually 61 years old. I mean, the the age range is anywhere from 19 to you know 60 plus years old. So in terms of an age, there is no profile. But in terms of female prostitute, drug addict, African American, I looked to see, and there are one, two, three, four, five. There are six women that went missing in that time frame of 2000 or 1999 to 2002 that fit the profile those would kind of possibly account for more of the bodies because there's six bodies there's been 12 identified but his note said 17 and then he at some point before he did kill himself did say that he had at least 20 victims yeah he could just be boasting that right he could yeah but i did find six of them that still to this day have not been found and that could very well be that the bodies just have never been found when i was looking um when i was researching this site as well i looked on casenet which if you're not familiar with CaseNet, Missouri has it's, I think some other states are, are adopting it. CaseNet is where you can look up yourself or anyone else and see any Anyone's crime. in the court system, right? Right, if you're in the court system. So it's anywhere. It's not just criminal. It's, it's civil. It's probate. It's family. If you've had a speeding ticket, anything, it's going to be in CaseNet. For the entire um, state of Missouri. Right. It's great for research. And so I actually looked up Maury Travis, and he did have quite a criminal history. In 1987, he was arrested for property damage in 1988 that was dismissed by the parties in 1997 he had a criminal infraction possession of a controlled substance 35 grams or less I don't remember what that was for and I didn't write it down but he got two two years probation I think it might have been cocaine in 1988 he had a criminal infraction for robbery first degree now this would have this is the charge that was that had him on probation when he was arrested in 2002. So he had a charge of robbery, first degree, armed criminal action, and he got a 15 year sentence. He had four charges of robbery, first degree, five charges of armed criminal action. Gets sentenced to 15 years. In 1989, he was speeding over the 70 mile per hour. He pled guilty. There was a failure to appear and then a warrant, and he got one day in jail for pleading guilty. And then I found a, let's see, in 1989, it's a rules 29.15 and a 24.035, which is a conviction after trial and a conviction after guilty plea. And it's it's lacking a little information because those cases back from then are not totally complete. They haven't, you know, moved everything over. And then in 2006, which is four years after his death, I found it kind of odd. There is he was being sued by Capital One and it was eventually dismissed in 2006. So that's the extent of his criminal history in CaseNet. Check it out. A really good documentary. Of course, Bill Curtis, my favorite, narrates the documentary. It's called A Map to Murder. You can find it on crimedocumentary.com. There's a couple of other references that I have as well. There's a couple. There's not a lot written about Maury Travis. There's not a lot out there about his background and how he grew up. The most recent though, and this is how it got me interested in the case again, is a woman renting a house and realized that the house she was renting was actually Maury Travis's house at 1001 Ford Drive in Ferguson, Missouri. And she tried to get out of the lease when she had realized that she was in the house that just you know, he lived and he did commit the murders. And his landlord, who was actually Maury Travis's mother, eventually, because media started to get involved, did allow her to get out of that. Now, I did look up that it looks like Sandra, his mother, it looks like she did sell the house a couple of years ago, probably after that whole incident took place. But I don't really have a confirmation on that. And I would love to get in touch with her, but I don't think this is something you want to kind of rehash with people. I can put an article up about that as well. Be good. And if you can't be good, be careful.